Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we've got a chronograph. And that's kind of the next step for me as far as repairing and restoring old vintage watches like this is working on one of my favorite complications actually, which is a chronograph. Now, this particular watch is a watch uh, from a company called Chronograph Suisse, which, which doesn't exist anymore uh, as far as I know, but used to make chronographs, uh, you know, from Switzerland. It's pretty straightforward what they are. You can see this, this one actually has an 18 karat gold case on it. That is a, an actual gold case, although it is quite thin and it has weird lugs. Look at that. It has these like inverted lugs. So I'll have to figure something out with that. And it looks like, yeah, maybe the crown was plated. It's not solid gold. They don't usually make crowns out of gold like that. And, uh, does it run a little? Yeah. Okay. A little bit. It does run. Um, I bought this one off of eBay and it said, um, it was for repair for parts to repair. So I'm not really sure what to expect out of this, but like I was saying, this for me is a major step because I previously have never worked on a chronograph before, and this is the first time I'm doing it. And they're kind of a lot. Um, you can see some perlage on the inside of that back case is pretty cool. And then there's another inner case here before we get to the movement, but let's take a look. <laughs> oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> uh, as you can see, there's a lot more going on on a chronograph movement than there is uh, on a normal one. The watch is running, although barely, it's not really wound up though. Yeah, there we go. You can see it's sort of kicked up now. And yeah, the chronograph does engage. Basically, I've been waiting for a long time until I felt really comfortable before I took the big step of starting to service chronographs. And uh, I took the classes online from Mark Lovick over at watchfix.com. He's the one that uh, inspired me through his YouTube channel, uh, which is called the Watch Repair Channel to even start or attempt to do watchmaking myself. I, I thought it was something that you just couldn't do on your own. And then I found his channel years ago um, and started watching basically every single video he put out. And, uh, and he inspired me. And, uh, you know, I've been on that journey ever since. And he's got a website called watchfix.com where you can go and take classes. I took them when I first started off. Uh, I basically, I can't recommend them highly enough. Um, it, this isn't an ad or anything like that. I just think that his uh, classes are the absolute best uh, and they're online and uh, I highly recommend them. And anyway, he, uh, after a long time, actually, it took him a while, he came out with a course on chronographs on how to service them and it is excellent. It really walks you through everything with graphics and all this crazy stuff, but it's intimidating. Like this is, now I kind of know how you feel when you watch me take apart a normal watch <laughs> where, it, where it seems, um, you know, kind of uh, overwhelming, even though for me, I've done normal watches enough times now that I feel comfortable. I'm okay, I know what this is, I know what the parts are called. Now I'm diving right back into the deep end of the pool again with this chronograph. But this is important to me because chronographs are some of my favorite types of watches. They're often used in like racing or flights or things like that, you know, kind of cool activities. And again, if you don't know, chronograph is just adding a stopwatch functionality to a regular watch. It allows you to, uh, you know, time something within the, the bounds of also showing, you know, hours, minutes, and seconds. So that's what we're going to do today. This chronograph Suisse is on the bench and we are going to completely take it apart, service it, see if we can get it working and try to learn something along the way as we go. Now you can see there's this outer movement ring that we need to take off here as well, but the movement is running. So that's, that's good. It's an old one, as you can see. And this, so the way the chronograph works is kind of interesting. It basically adds an entire extra layer of mechanics to the watch that use the running watch underneath as the power source to run that extra timekeeping that it has available to it. And that's how it works. It's, um, it's kind of interesting. Um, it does mean that that mainspring, that one piece of metal has to do all of that work now. So it can be a little bit harder for the watch and be a little more demanding. And there's a bunch of finicky little things that I learned as well, taking the classes, but now it's time to put them into action. 
And the first thing I'm gonna do is take off this little jumper spring, and that's because I wanna to try to remove the dial. But in order for me to remove the dial, I need to get to that screw that's underneath. It's actually uh, that one right there. It's actually not a screw, it's, it's, a, it's called an eccentric. It turns and it has a, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, like an oddly shaped um, piece of metal on the other side that pushes up against the post. And as you can see, I've already made one mistake. I took off the hour, seconds, and minutes hand, and then I forgot to take off the sub-seconds here uh, the, and the sub-minutes hand. So great start. Uh, the good news is I noticed it before I started doing anything crazy, but uh, yeah, already uh, <laughs> out of my comfort zone, I guess. Okay, we'll put the hands in this membrane box and set it aside. And now that I've gotten access to that eccentric under there, it means I can take off the dial. I really love the style of this watch. The The numerals are awesome. It's got this, you just don't see that color, that sort of honey colored, you know, dial going on. It really has a vibe to it. And uh, I'm hoping this watch will look and run well by the time we're done with this restoration. Okay, this side looks exactly the same like a normal watch. There's a Canon pinion right there. There's the keyless works. I can use my Canon pinion removal tool to remove the Canon pinion safely. And now we can flip the movement back over and put the winding crown and stem back in. Oop, okay. <laughs> well, I guess I was right about, the, uh, about that crown being about dead. It looks like the whatever was left of the plating just fell off of it. It's also quite dirty, so we're gonna need to address that for sure. Probably just have to replace that crown ultimately. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, I've never really seen that come off quite like that, but at any rate, uh, the crown should still function properly even if it doesn't really look very good at the moment. And now we can take off the balance. And again, this part's the same as, you know, how I would do any other watch. Now, I, normally I would let the mainspring down here. I would let the power out of the mainspring. But I actually am not 100% sure where to do that on this movement. So I'm just going to start by taking off the balance. I can do this safely regardless of uh, whether there's power in the mainspring or not. And then we'll we'll just proceed from there. I mean, it sh there shouldn't be hardly any power in there. I didn't wind the watch up, and this is a manual wind chronograph. This is what they call a cam-based chronograph as well. There's a few different kinds that exist, and this one's a cam-based one. There's also pillar wheel, which maybe I'll do one of those someday on the channel too. There's this bridge that goes over these top two wheels of the chronograph, and these are actually quite important wheels. And as you can see, there's this funny shaped piece of metal that seems to be in the way. I can kind of move it out of the way. And this wheel right here is called the minute recording wheel. That records not seconds, but minutes of elapsed time by the chronograph. And this is a spring on the outside that puts some pressure on the cam itself. So we'll take that off. And then what I think I'm gonna do here, it, I don't normally do this, but given that it's my first time working on a chronograph, there's a lot of extra screws that are very similar. And so I'm just gonna replace them where they go. It's okay to clean them like that, that doesn't hurt anything. And it will mean that I have less of a chance of forgetting or getting confused about where one goes. And I mean, look, when I don't even know where the main parts go naturally, like when I put together a regular watch on the channel, you know, I, I just remember where they go because I've seen them a bunch of times. And if I get stuck, I'll look at my video that I took sometimes too. But this one, like, I don't even know where the parts go just offhand. So I'm gonna try to make my life simple here in the early stages and, uh, and take that off. Now this is called the coupling clutch. And then this wheel that I'm taking out in the middle right here, that one is the, uh, the chronograph runner wheel. In other words, that's the wheel that turns to turn the chronograph seconds hand that's in the middle of the watch on the other side. Now this big funny looking piece of metal, this is the um, return hammer. And this has two sur flat surfaces on the end of it that will actually act on a heart shaped cam on those wheels to return them back to zero. It's a, it's a really cool design that we can look at more uh, when we put the watch back together. And again, I'm gonna continue to just put the screws 
back where I found them. This one's, this one's a shouldered screw, so it has a shouldered part on the bottom. This is called the operating lever. And I think I can just take it out of the way, yeah. One of the things that, I, that you learn um, pretty quickly when, when either learning about or working on these chronographs is that not everything is as it seems. Um, some of these screws that you see uh, operate much differently than the screws that you get on a normal watch. Uh, this one, by the way, is reverse threaded, and you can tell because it has three lines etched onto the top of it rather than just the normal two. That's a big hint. If you see that, that means that that screw is not righty-tighty, lefty-loosey, but instead the opposite. But yeah, there's actually multiple types of uh, components that are used that actually look just like a screw but but aren't. Okay, now this is called the coupling clutch. This is what uh, links up the power from the regular watch to the chronograph part of the watch when it's engaged. And as you can see, like for example, that looked like it was screwed down, but it wasn't. That was actually sitting on an eccentric. I'm gonna take off this chronograph driving wheel here. This is the wheel that's attached to the regular rot, uh, watch works and that uh, derives all the power from. And that'll allow me to get underneath here and continue to take apart the watch uh, back to familiarity, thank, thankfully, with the, uh, with the pallet fork and the pallet fork bridge underneath. And as you can see, there is actually a little bit of power left in the watch as well. So uh, again, normally I prefer to just let that unwind it, you know, under my control, but here it was just a little bit. And plus this watch is kind of gunked up. So it went slowly anyway. This one's called the sliding gear and I need to, uh, remove that spring out of the way so that I can get it there. And with those parts off, we've got all of the chronograph parts disassembled, which actually went fairly quickly, even though I'm still like not really that comfortable with those parts yet. But that means I can take off the train wheel bridge, which will give me access to the escape wheel. And the rest look like they're still kind of stuck. Now I'm going to need to unfortunately just take this little spring. I don't actually need to take it off for cleaning. I just need to take it off so that I can have access to the screw that's actually holding this bridge down. And this is where having experience working on regular non-chronograph watches really helps because I can look and see which one of these screws or things that are masquerading as screws uh, look like they're actually holding down the bridge. And as you can see, the buttons, the pushers as they're called, just fall away once I take that bridge off. Now I can take off the rest of the train of wheels. So there's the center wheel, that's the fourth wheel there with that long pivot. And I can take off the... Uh, barrel as well. And this is all the normal stuff now. So now I'm kind of like, I feel like I can cruise through now because I can flip the watch over here. Here's the keyless and motion works. I can take those both out. And those look again, exactly the same. Basically, this is a fully dedicated chronograph, but one, and, and some of them aren't. And what I mean by that is you can view this as having like a regular watch with extra stuff added on. That isn't the case in this one. This one's designed to be a chronograph. There is no like regular version of this movement um, that, that isn't a chronograph, but some modern ones are. They, there's a company uh, that makes modules that you can put on commonly used movements that sort of turn it into, uh, add functionality like GMT 24 hour or even a chronograph. All right, well, we'll take this ratchet wheel off. It's just attached to the barrel. And now we can free this <laughs> heavily de in demand mainspring. It does look like it's the original mainspring as well. I may just reuse it though. We'll see how it looks. If there's no damage on it, I might just reuse it. I might try to find a replacement too, I don't know yet. Yeah, it looks okay. I mean, it is the old school kind, but it looks all right. All right, I've got another project um, in the uh, watch cleaning machine at the moment. So I'm just going to put these 
in the parts tray, but I'm going to try to organize them the best I can. Normally I don't worry about it, but here I think oh, maybe it might help a little bit if I keep them more organized before they go into the cleaning machine. Now let's take a quick look at the case and the crystal here. As you can see, the crystal's well worn and it's a little bit discolored too. It actually has a slight bluish hint to it. And I, I kind of want to resolve that. So I'll probably end up replacing the crystal, assuming it comes out of the case okay. And now we can get to the watch cleaning machine. All the parts are in this basket now and they're gonna go in and they're gonna get fully cleaned on a three-step cleaning and plus a drying cycle as well in this uh, old school cleaning machine that probably came out around the same time the watch did. And while that happens, I didn't wanna mention, I've got a Patreon for this channel. That's a way that you can support the content creators that make the stuff that you love. You know, whether it's podcasts, videos like mine, you know, songs, uh, artwork, music, whatever it is, um, you know, you're going to be able to find it on Patreon most likely. And it's just a way, again, just to give back and support the creators that make the stuff that maybe brightens your day or whatever. So if that's, if I'm one of them, um, you know, you can head over to patreon.com slash wristwatch revival, and you'll get a thank you card and a wristwatch revival sticker in the mail, no matter what level you sign up for. And you get some cool perks as well. Um, you know, you can get, see the early cuts of the videos, usually a few days before they actually go up, things like that. Uh, and again, thank you to everybody who supports me. Now take a look at the movement all laid out. That is a lot of parts, but it looks good and it cleaned up pretty nicely, especially for an older watch here. I think this one's probably from the late 40s or somewhere in the 40s, I would guess, just by the styling and the technology that's in it. Okay, so the first thing we need to do, of course, is take care of this mainspring. So I'm gonna use my mainspring winders for that. Thankfully, I have a tool that helps me put these mainsprings back in. You technically can do it by hand, but it's very, very difficult to do it without contaminating the spring, either bending it up or getting little bits of your finger cots in there or, you know, grease from your fingers or, you know, just, it's really hard to, to walk it back in. If you don't have one of these mainspring winders, you can certainly do it, but it is definitely not best practices, I guess is the, the way to put it. But the, the mainspring winders are very expensive. So it's, it's totally understandable. There, there's a few uh, kind of knockoff versions of them, but they haven't gotten very good reviews from other watchmakers for longevity and sometimes for functionality as well. So it kind of puts amateur watchmakers like us in a little bit of a pickle until you can save up for these uh, fancy ones. But after you do, you get to hear that sound, which is fantastic. It looks like the edge, okay, it's just sticking up a little bit, but I'm able to push it back down with, the, uh, with my tweezers, and that means that we can continue with the rebuild. So first, the barrel arbor will go in, and again, this is all normal. The, this stuff is is very much in my comfort zone. If you watch my videos a lot, you've seen me do this before, right? So that this is definitely breathing easy, but I'm nervous because, oh boy, it's one thing when you, I, I, I took Mark's course, uh, the one I mentioned before twice. I went through it twice. Uh, I took notes. Like I was really trying to like concentrate, but I'll tell you, there's just no substitute for just getting in there, right? And well, this watch wasn't cheap, and it is one that I really think is a stylish and cool watch. I mean, ultimately, if I just totally screw this up, you know, I can chalk it up to experience and try to maybe find some spare parts or something. So it's not real pressure, but at the same time, I do feel it. I, <laughs> I, I really want this to go well, and of course, you know, I want this to be cool for you to come along as well, so I feel that pressure as well. On myself, not from you, don't worry. A little bit of uh, grease left over there. You don't want to leave it just sitting around the movement. So some Rodico can clean that up before we put in the setting lever screw. Now, before um, I put on the uh, barrel bridge, I remembered or noticed <laughs> that on the underside here is the crown wheel. Uh, usually this sits on top, but I'm assuming because it's a chronograph that they ran out of room or there was some reason that, that it couldn't sit on top. So I'm going to take that apart now. Now, normally I would have taken that apart before going in the watch cleaning machine, but I didn't actually notice that that there was a crown wheel on the bottom. So I'm going to just give it a quick rinse and then uh, clean it up with the Rodico to make sure that there's nothing on there. And then I can now go about replacing it. So that part will spin on the outer side. So I'm going to lubricate the bottom and then the inner part where it meets up. 
with this. So just a quick cleaning on that. There's also the click on the underside as well, which would have gotten clean just fine. It also explains why I couldn't find it. Usually though, and I'm sure it's the case with this one, there's a little cutout in the bridge that will allow you to see the part of the click that you can manipulate with tweezers or a screwdriver to be able to let down the mainspring because that's something that you know often happens when you get a watch in for service is that it's wound up uh, to some level. But again, not having experience with this uh, movement or even type of watch at all, uh, I didn't notice where that click was. Okay, so now let's start reassembling here. Now this is a very important wheel on a chronograph. This is a fourth wheel with extended pivot that goes up the top. And on the top of that is where we will attach the uh, chronograph driving wheel. Uh, it just gets friction fit onto the top. But again, that's what connects the normal running of the watch, the mainspring, all to the co components of the uh, chronograph part. So it's really, really important. Now we can put the center wheel in place. And again, this is normal. Kind of have that weird feeling like, do you ever get that feeling at work where like, you've got a few things that you need to do. And one of them is complicated and scary. And the other one is something that you've done a bunch of times before. And so you just start off by doing the thing that you've done before, because it makes you feel like you're doing something, even though in the back of your head, you're like, I really got to figure out how to solve that other problem that I don't know how to solve yet. That's what this feels like. Now, I don't have a choice. I have to do it in this order. But I'll tell you, I, having the chronograph parts that I've never done before, it, it's looming. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh God. And then also like, I just hope that I can get this watch running well enough just as a watch. Like that, that is already enough of a challenge for me, uh, you know, on a watch to watch basis. Okay. So again, that extended pivot comes through the uh, jewel. You can see it sticking up there. And it also means that you have to be careful when you put on this bridge that it engages that properly. And it looks like the wheels aren't quite aligned. So we'll just gently tweak around until that happens. There we go. So we just needed those to fall into their pivots. And again, you don't want to put any big pressure on any of these things. You don't want to be smashing around with those wheels. You know, you take your time with this and it'll come together. One of the best things about watchmaking as a hobby is that yes, it can be difficult and it can be frustrating. And I'm going to oil the jewels up here. But at the same time, there's no time limit. You're not, you know, nobody's waiting for you to finish this project watch of yours. It can take you two weeks, even if it would take a professional watchmaker half a day or a day or something, it's fine. Just take your time with it. If you get frustrated, walk away, no problem. If you get stuck, no problem, walk away. There's resources out there that'll help you uh, in the meantime, and you can just take your time with it. That's how I did it when I first started. Okay, so we can start by adding in uh, the spring and then um, also the sliding gear because it kind of goes down at the bottom. And here's an example of one of these screws that I was talking about. That screw right there is actually just something that holds that little lip in place. It doesn't do anything else, but provide it so that that lip can't go flying upwards. That's it. And like this screw that I just took off here is a shouldered screw. And so I can put the return hammer in place. This is that one that resets everything to zero. And yes, I do have to pull that spring out of the way so that it can gauge with this cam. This uh, return hammer has the cam on one end and then the actual hammers on the other end. But that's a shouldered screw. So that has you know a place for it so that that cam can slide back and forth and it's held in place enough, but not you know, the normal thing where it would like screw it down and hold it there. And I haven't even gotten to the, the true eccentrics on here. And I, I mean that like as a noun, these are, it's a type of, it's not a screw. I don't actually know how to, a component, a watch component called a concentric. And uh, I had to learn about them for this. I've, I've been familiar, you know, there's a few on the other types of watches, but they're really important for chronographs because they actually, uh, are how you adjust the different distances between the chronograph parts so that it operates properly. And I didn't know that until I started learning these. So this part right here, for example, is called the coupling clutch. And I need to move a, a few parts around here to get it to lay down, but the key, oh, don't do that now. Okay, I'll just set this aside for now. But where it actually engages, where it pivots on the back here, 
is actually an eccentric. It is not a screw. This part right here that I'm pointing at, that is actually an eccentric. And what that is, is it looks exactly like a screw. But the difference is, is that the screw where the threaded part comes and it meets the head of the screw, it meets it directly in the middle on a screw, right? Like that's just how you would make a, a screw, obviously. But on an eccentric, it is off center and there's no threads underneath it, it's just a post. So when you turn it, it acts kind of like a cam does in a car, if you're familiar with that, where it, as you can just turn it over and over again because there's no, um, there's no threads underneath it, it's just a post. And as you turn it, whatever it's bump pushed up against will move further away and then closer and then further away and then closer as the lobe of the top of the eccentric turns around. And that is how, uh, when they're placed strategically, it's how you can adjust distances between parts so that you can get tolerances how you want them. We're gonna be doing that in just a little bit. In the meantime, I can continue with the reassembly here. This is a little bit tricky because this bar is held under tension. So I have to really hold it down with my, my pointer stick here and then that will allow me to screw it into place finally. And there you can see it works just fine. Now, when you push one of the pushers in, that's, uh, that's what it actually moves. And this one's uh, the other pusher. Okay, well that starting to look like chronography type stuff. Now, one thing of course that needs to happen along the way is lubrication. I need to make sure that I'm putting oils and greases so that this uh, chronograph mechanism can operate efficiently and hopefully for a very long time. This uh, particular movement is uh, made by a company called Landeron that I don't believe they exist anymore, but boy, they were super popular for making these type of movements there. I believe that these are based on a movement from a company called Venus and they kind of became the de facto. So here's a chronograph runner wheel. And I'll use a little bit of medium oil here just to make sure that it can run smoothly. And do you see that heart-shaped cam on the top of it? That has one and this one does as well. And that is what that return hammer pushes up against. And, uh, that is to bring it to the flat side of that cam. And that is zero. That's when things are completely reset. This part here is called the minute recording wheel. And again, that's because chronographs like this, when you hit start on them, they, the seconds hand will start to go around to tell you how many seconds have gone by. But you might be wanting to you know, track more than just seconds, right? You might be wanting to track Minutes, for example, like, you know, let's be realistic. You're making spaghetti, right? And you wanna, you wanna cook your, your pasta for 11 minutes or whatever. The seconds hand won't tell you that unless you're staring at it the whole time. So it's pretty critical that you get some, at least some way to record minutes as well as seconds. And then some chronographs even record hours. Uh, this one doesn't though. Okay, just make sure everything's lined up and then I can tighten down the bridge and make sure that these two wheels are aligned as well as these two in the back. And this is just kind of fiddling around to make sure that everything looks like it's running loose and aligned up and, and looks pretty good. Now what I'm doing here, this is interesting. So this is putting lubricant on the front lobes of this heart-shaped cam. And the reason for that is when the return hammer hits it, it must slide along that edge until the cam is on the top part of the heart, if you will, which is up against a flat surface of the, of the uh, return hammer. And so I need to do this on both of these and it needs to be done right because if there's no lubrication there, uh, this is a lot of force that that hammer hits. It's spring-loaded and it slams into those cams because when the person pushes reset on a chronograph, you want those hands to snap back into place. They, you don't want them to kind of just make their way back over slowly. You want it to like, you know, boom, right back into place. Now this is the chronograph driving wheel that I mentioned before that goes on that fourth wheel pivot. So I need to set it back into place. And again, it's just held on by friction. And it does look like it's aligned 
currently, so that could be good. Now, I don't know if this was a mistake or not, but I do need to put on the pushers, and that means I need to kind of loosen up a few of the parts that I had already put on. So I probably should have just done it at the same time, but whatever, it's, it's not a big deal to go back and do it. And so there's a pusher, and here's the other one. And again, I had to, to take off the part I've already put on, but I, get, I, I don't need to like fully remove it, I just need to kind of get it out of the way so I can get the pusher into the groove and then put it back on. But I think next time I'll probably just put the pushers on with their levers. Okay, so we've got that at least mostly assembled on the chronograph side, and it wasn't too bad. I think I was expecting a little bit more difficult than that, but you know, I have been doing this a while, so maybe I'm, maybe I learned from the class. I don't know, but also, you know, that we're not done with it yet. <laughs> so let's uh, let's flip the watch over though and get back to more normal stuff. Now, I did notice um, putting the watch together that the sliding clutch looks like it may have some damage on it. I'm just gonna put it into place for now. Uh, and try to address that problem a little bit later because I kind of want to get a full accounting of where this watch is at before I start looking for parts on eBay or doing anything like that. Sometimes with a watch, you'll have like one part that you need. And it makes more sense just to try to find somebody who's selling that one part. But sometimes if you need more than one part, it's better to find like a, a donor movement or something like that. All right, Canon pinion on, minute wheel goes on, intermediate wheel goes on. This is all the keyless works. Even on a chronograph, this is the uh, the part of the watch that it still does the same job. It lets you wind up the watch and it lets you set the hands. That's called the yoke. Sometimes people get um, there's two words that are similar and they're used in watches and they sometimes get them confused. Again, this is a chronograph, but there's also a thing called a chronometer. It's spelled like chronometer, but it's chronometer. And a chronometer isn't actually a complication. It's not a function of a watch. It's a description of its accuracy. There are companies entities uh, in Switzerland, and I think there's also in Japan and stuff, that will um, certify a watch that it is a specific, that it meets certain requirements for accuracy. And it's not only, you know, seconds per day and that type of thing in different positions, but it can also be at different temperatures, you know, really hot, really cold, does it hold up under those. And so those watches that get sent off to be chronometer certified will usually put that on the front of the watch because they're quite proud of it. It also costs them money to have it done. And not every watch passes that kind of test. You know, a good example is Rolex is famous because they send all their watches there. All their sports watches are chronometer certified. Chronometer grade is also another way you'll put it. But sometimes people get that mixed up with chronograph because the words are kind of similar, but they're completely different things. Okay, so now we can put the winding crown and the stem. And again, I'm not planning on keeping that crown, but this is still just sort of initial build territory where we're making sure that everything's going right. Also, I, I just want to make sure that the watch runs. I want to make sure that it runs okay. It needs to be lubricated, all the other stuff as well. Okay, we can put the pallet fork and its friend the pallet fork bridge into place. I'll usually just gently set it into place and then not fully tighten down that bridge because now I can just manipulate the pallet fork a little bit to make sure that it's seated properly in the jewel, both in the top or bottom. And one way to do that easily is just to wind up the watch a little bit and then you can just gently tip the pallet fork back and forth like that and it should jump across to the other banking pin like you saw there. And when you see it do that, that's a good chance that it's locked in and then you can finish tightening it down like that. Okay, here we go. Let's get the balance in here. We've got all the components of the watch uh, currently in place, but I don't know if everything's working yet because I the watch isn't running and we need the balance to do that. So take a deep breath. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so this is good. The watch is running again. We saw that it was kind of running before when I first got it, so I'm happy to see that. It does look like it's running a little low, even though... Okay, it's kicking up a little bit. Okay, so it does look like it's running okay, but um, of course, we're going to need to oil the jewels and stuff before we really know you know, how well a watch like this is running. It, it is incredible the difference that that can make. You can try out the buttons real quick. Uh, it actually does seem like it's working, at least just barely functionally. Okay, so we've passed that hurdle. Uh, the watch is at least somewhat functional. But now, uh, in order to do the cleaning process properly, unfortunately, we need to remove the balance once again because this does not have a shock protection setting on the top. This is an older watch, again, probably from the 40s, maybe early 50s, and these watches did not have that technology yet. And that means that you need to completely disassemble the balance just to clean it. Now, before we do, I can go ahead and, and oil up the jewels of the watch here as well. So we'll go through and we're, we'll oil up the uh, train wheel jewels here. We'll also oil the chronograph jewels. And we'll even do some of the ones that aren't jeweled. This is where the barrel arbor fits on the bottom of the movement. And as you can see, if I'm patient with my oiling stick here, the oil will actually just seep into the gap between the two pieces of metal. And uh, that's primarily, pri primarily a longevity thing rather than a performance thing. That, that particular pivot spins extremely slowly. So it's not under a, a huge amount of, uh, you know, constant friction or anything like that. But uh, you do want it to be able to spin smoothly over a long period of time. So now I can start by doing the bottom actually of the uh, balance. And that means that I can take off this cap jewel and put a little tiny drop of oil right in the center of it, and then I can replace it. So this is one half of what I need to do. But as I mentioned, the re one of the reasons that I had to take off the balance again was because I need to disassemble it so that I can do the other half of this. Yeah, these non-shock protected watches, I mean, they're still pretty tough, but if you drop them, you will break a balance pivot pretty often. So you do want to be extra careful with them. All right, now I need to take a, take apart the balance, which means using a very small screwdriver under very delicate conditions to remove the uh, balance wheel and the balance spring assembly. And I'm just going to throw that in some one dip. That's a solvent that use, is used to clean these type of things. And in the meantime, I can take the balance bridge and disassemble it. It's held together by two screws. And then there's three components. There's the main bridge part. And then as you'll see, there's also a cap jewel, which is what I'm going to be cleaning. And then there's a regulator arm here as well, right there. And they're all just kind of sandwiched together. So this is the cap jewel, but take a look. Do you see that stain? That's where the oil was. That's the, that is exactly what dried on oil looks like. Um, and we'll of course need to clean that so we can take out both of these parts and put them on some paper. I use post-it notes uh, because it's it's nice and absorbent and it's not using like a whole piece of paper every single time. It's relatively small. And I'll clean it with some peg wood and just taking a quick look, the jewel is not in perfect shape. You can see some blemishes that are actually on the top, but there's no more stain on the bottom part. And that's really nice. So that did clean off nicely. And now I'm gonna do what the watchmaker did however many years ago <laughs> before, and I'm gonna put a drop of oil. Now, one thing to note here is that the oils are vastly improved from the old days. Uh, these are all synthetic oils that I'm using and they're really good performing oils. They last for a long time. They don't break down very quickly and they're, they're excellent uh, for servicing watches. But back when this maybe got its last service, there was some pretty suspect oils being used. If you look at the old books, I mean, you, there's whale blubber that's mentioned. I mean, there's a lot of organic oils, like very organic oils. And I assume that those were didn't last particularly long. Also, they had to be stinky, right? Like, let's just be real. Okay, now I can put the regulating arm back on as well. It just sort of slides over the top of the cap jewel. And with that done, I can now uh, replace the uh, balance wheel on here. And again, it's just that little tiny screw 
that holds it into place. This is the, called the stud that I have to engage. And then I can use this, again, little baby screwdriver to replace that. And now we can put it back in the watch again and see how things are running. Now that we've got all the oiling done, hopefully it kicks up nicely. Oh, <laughs> it wants to go. <laughs> what that usually means is that the uh, balance bridge here just isn't fully aligned, like it's, it's off kilter a little bit. Because there, see how it kind of seats itself once it gets going? And now it actually does look like it's running quite a bit stronger. So let's take a quick look on the time grapher and see how it's doing. After some tweaking of regulation. Uh, four seconds. A little bit low on amplitude, but pretty good timing. Okay, this actually isn't too bad. I'm pretty happy with it. Now... We do need to though do some adjusting. Now if you notice here, it's I'm missing a screw. And as I mentioned before, when I put this in, take a look at this. Do you see how it's damaged? Some of those teeth have been worn off or shorn off. So enter donor movement. I found this one uh, on eBay. I made a, an offer for it and, uh, and the guy accepted it. So I've got this. So that's the screw that I need to replace because I've got at least two parts here that I need to replace. And who knows if I need to do more. So it just makes sense to do it. And then I'll hang on to the rest of the parts in case I work on this type of movement again, which I plan on doing, by the way, I love chronographs. Like I said before, it is my favorite complication. The watches that got me into vintage watches are from a company called Hoyer. They're now called Tag Hoyer. They were purchased. But back in the day, they were just called Hoyer. And they're uh, racing watches. And my dad was really into racing. So I grew up around cars and all that kind of stuff my whole life. Uh, both sides of my family, in fact, are, are super into cars and all that. And so uh, I love the old racing Hoyer chronographs that were famous uh, back in the 60s. Okay, so this is a replacement screw now as well. Uh, actually, it's the shouldered screw. And now we need to do some adjusting. So this is where the chronograph driving wheel and the coupling clutch meet up. And do you see that? That is that eccentric I was talking about right there, that thing. So if I turn that, that's going to actually move back and forth the where that whole assembly sits. And I know it's weird, but it is actually how it works. So if I do this, it'll actually bring it a little bit closer and then we can see if we can do that. So do you see how those teeth are now meshed properly and there's not that sloppy play between them? That's gonna make it drive smoothly. Now this is the chronograph when it's engaged right here. So that's that uh, coupling clutch and that's the chronograph running wheel right in the middle with the little baby teeth. And this is what you wanna see here as well. Because you know it can even be completely apart. Now on this part, that's called a jumper spring that is on the minute recording wheel, the, the little hand on the front that records how many minutes has gone by. And do you see that little triangle sticking out? That is called the chronograph runner wheel finger. And what it does is it pushes this over, watch. And do you see how it snapped over? That was that spring guiding it. That represents one minute, but did you see how it hit it on the other side? You don't want it to do that. So what I can do is there's another eccentric that I can use to gently move the distance between those two. And let's see if I can get it a little bit better as this finger comes around. We want it to grab and then click over like that. And then ideally it doesn't touch the wheel at all on the exit. That's kind of what you're hoping for. But as you can see, this is quite finicky work to get it right. So we can try it one more time. Click and okay, it did technically still touch it, but I'm gonna be happy with that because those are such tiny, tiny adjustments that you're making. But that looks good to me. I, I think this chronograph is gonna run actually all right. Now. There's more to do though, uh, besides just the movement, of course, and we'll test it out in a minute. Uh, but this crown is done. It's bent up. It's also uh, lost its its uh, plating and it is just time for a new one. So we're gonna get a new one and there it is. Now it's a little bit thicker, but I kind of like that look. I mean, you don't wanna go huge. It's the same diameter, but it just sticks out a little bit more. Um, also, it was just the one that I could find um, that fit this particular tap. The tap is the threading, how big the threading is 
on there. And uh, so we'll replace that. Now taking a quick look at the case, it is what it is. It's super thin. It is 18 karat gold, but it's not exactly like a solid case. I think I could bend it with my hands and just fold it up if I really wanted, which I don't. Uh, but I did get a new crystal for the case. And as you can see with the crystal out, that shouldn't be a big problem. So let's replace the crystal on the case before we get to recasing. I also wanted to mention, um, you know, I've been talking a lot on this uh on this video about watchmaking as a hobby. And I really do think that it's a fantastic hobby and I think that you should try it. And with that in mind, I started a website with my friend, Alex. It's called SutcliffeHanson.com. That's our last names. And we have toolkits that I designed. Like I picked every tool that goes in them, uh, any, everywhere from beginner to advanced, um, to, to hopefully encourage you to try out the hobby to see if it sticks with you and if you like it. And uh, again, there's a link down below for Sutcliffe Hansen if you wanna check that out. We also sell watches and some select watch straps with more to come there. We also auction off the watches that I have repaired on this channel uh, that weren't for outside people. So yeah, I'd appreciate it if you check out the site. Um, at any rate, here goes the movement ring. And now the dial can go back on as well. Now this is a little bit awkward because I need to get to those eccentrics that actually turn up against the dial post. And I realize only afterwards, again, live and learn, that the uh, minute jumper spring that we were just fiddling around with, well, it sits right on top of one of those eccentrics that holds the post in for the dial. So I actually need to remove it again and put it back on. Again, th these aren't a huge deal. It just takes a little bit of extra time. And these are the types of things that you can learn you know, and go, okay, well, I'm not gonna make that mistake again. Now we can put the hands back on. Now th this hand on the side here is a running seconds hand. It, it just goes all the time um, for normal timekeeping. So that one's pretty straightforward. And there it goes. Now the one on the other side is the minute recording hand. And as you can see, it records up to 30 minutes there. And so this one does need to be put where it's going to sit in its natural state rather than the second hand, which is just gonna be turning around anyway, so you can just kind of throw it on. What do you think of this dial? I think it's awesome. It also has a tachymeter around the edge, which is a cool way to time speed the way that you would do it here in the States, for example, is if you're driving in your car and you see a mile marker, you can hit your chronograph if it has tachymeter around the edge. And then when you get to the next one, hit it again and it'll tell you how fast you were going. You can do that for any distance, by the way, in any measure. Now, I noticed that the uh, second hand was a little bit bent out of shape on the bottom, so I'm very, very gently going to nudge it back just so it's not quite as crooked. If it's a little bit, I mean, this is an old watch and it is what it is, but it was pretty bent. So very carefully nudging that back. That just isn't the type of thing that you can push around. Like if you do, it'll just break off and that's it. That looks much better though. Now this one again is the chronograph seconds hand. So that needs to, to go up at the top there and where it's gonna go when it gets reset. And then I can gently push it into place as well. Now we can case up the watch. I can't wait to see how this thing looks with the new crystal and the case on that really cool dial. Like I said, I can't think of a watch that has that. And I'll, I'll wait a minute until you get to see that part. Now we can put on the crown though, and the stem with, with the new crown as well. And let's see how it looks. Ooh, well, I guess you do get a sneak peek here, but there's a bit of a gap there. Do you see that? So that's not gonna do, that, that, that just looks terrible. It actually would be functionally the same, but I'm not gonna leave it like that. I just don't think it looks nice. So what we need to do is trim down the stem underneath and I've got end cutters and after measuring carefully, we can ugh, do that. So that will, send off uh, just the tip of it. Now, unfortunately though, it will get 
uh, burrs on it and that can tear up the crown because it's just made of brass. So we do need to round off the burrs and make sure it's nice. And then we can put it back on and get a better fit on this crown. Okay. Make sure that it uh, engages properly and all that. And well, that's actually, I think it actually did go in further. Well, we'll see on the, on the final shot. I think I didn't actually engage it back all the way in at that point. Now, taking a look at the watch, it looks freaking awesome. And now let's test out the chronograph as well. So you can see that the chronograph starts up when I go. So that part's cool. And it looks like it's running smoothly. I mean, you can see the graduations, but not nothing crazy. And then, yeah, there we go. It resets back up to the middle. So that's nice. And it does look like it's working well. Now, we need to put the finishing touches on this watch. This is these weird hollow uh, spring bars that I found. And I put them into a, a normal watch strap here. <laughs> and then take a look at the final product. How cool is this watch? What a neat, I mean, it just has a real vibe to it. I, you know, there's just, you just don't see this style of watch being produced these days. And it even has a functional and working chronograph. We did it. We made it through our first chronograph service, all the little mini adjustments, all the crazy new parts. And uh, I'm really proud of myself. This is a major step for me and, uh, and for you as well, because you're coming along on the journey with me, right? So we can now do chronographs. Now, there are other types of chronographs that I need to learn too, so we're not quite done. And my comfort level could be a little bit better. That being said, I'm really proud of how this one came out. And it is a beautiful watch. I'm going to be proud to wear this one. Thank you so much for coming along. If you want to find me on Instagram, I am wristwatch underscore revival. I'd love to say hi to you over there. And uh, with that, I'll see you next time.